had fun. I had fun. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Fuck off. It's morning for me. Thank you. How many guys actually hack in here? How many of you are full of shit and really aren't raising your hand? All right, the rest of you. Um, we're going to talk about some issues that have really got me all crazy in the last couple of years. Thanks to Renderman back there. It's all his fault. And we're defending, and a lot of fun for hearing, and all you go to RSA and all that. We're defending against the past. And that's why we're still so, been so screwed. And why we're screwed. Anybody think that we've got all the security shit down really working well? Show of hands and we'll toss your ass out of the room fast. Is that again you, sir? And you're still out. You can't fuck with the speaker. Come on. And back when, uh, a number of years ago, uh, I, I wrote a book that's called Information Warfare, in 1991 or something. And the, oh, thanks. And the, the day after, a couple days after it came out, the FBI and CIA are at my door going, where did you learn all of this stuff? It's all classified. I have never had a clearance, don't want a clearance. And it was, I really didn't quite understand the question. How could this be classified if I thought of it? So got into a lot of trouble with the feds. Uh, the Brits decided to ban the book and realized after six weeks that was not a successful strategy, and information warfare was about attack mindset methodology, and in front of Congress and all that stuff, and back in those days they said, Mr. Schwartow, why would the bad guys ever want to use the internet? That was the belief system when I got involved in all this crap way back when, and I don't believe the mindset has changed very much. Have we done a really awesome job of security in the last 20 years? Show of hands. Any vendors with a show of hands? So, way back when, we were talking about the issues that hackers were vilified thanks to John Markoff and all the crap back in those days, and people didn't listen. People didn't understand and did not want to believe anything that we were saying. And the concept of cyber terrorism back in 1988 was, what the fuck? What are you talking, you nuts? And I seriously, for many years, was wondering and kind of praying that where we are today was never going to come to pass. Well, unfortunately, I was right about too many things. And it was kind of like almost a science fictionish thing in many people's minds. And in my mind, I had a great deal of doubt as well, because I was so disgusted with the state of the security industry and vendors doing their bullshit to us all. And vendors in the room, I'm sorry, I'm a vendor too, and hopefully I don't lie much, but some of the vendors out there are like, damn, come on, let's get real. So some of these predictions have come true over the years. Uh, some of the stuff I talked about, um, malware, I, you know, it was like, going to be a form of war. No, it's not, Schwartow. You're crazy. All right. Uh, chipping. Uh, back in those days, I made the hypothesis that we were going to end up with third-party source silicon with built-in malware. Schwartow, you're out of your mind. Intel would never do that to us. You're missing the point here. And now, finally, there is some national awareness at the DOD level that chipping or embedded hostile silicon, whatever term you want to use, third-party knockoffs, all that kind of crap, is actually real. Uh, we're going to talk about HERF and EMP uh, a little bit, and uh, back in 94, 95, I guess it was, at InfoWarCon in D.C., we set off a one terawatt EMP weapon right next to National Airport. It was really cool. And uh, we made sure people with pacemakers weren't there. But again, this was all off-the-shelf terrorist-level technology that I was interested in some 20 years ago. And how is this, how is this technology going to be adapted uh, for the coming, in the coming years? So some of the global things uh, back in those early days, even before the Marsh Commission in 96, I was trying to say this stuff is a national security asset, information and economy and all these things, and everybody said, bullshit, bullshit, it's not real, it's not going to ever happen. 
and we chose the ignorance and arrogance and apathy roots, uh, especially through Washington. And I guess some of you still go through bosses who don't believe this stuff, right? There's a few of you out there like, no, no, we're never going to bother with us. We're just good guys. We only have ketchup. Nobody cares about us. Well, that is obviously from the paranoid hacker security mindset. Absolutely not true. So we've been trying to move this forward somewhat, and even in the military, it's uh, really quite many places the same. The Air Force says, we make the rubble bounce. Great. What about all the stuff that's pre-kinetic? And I've always been interested in the pre-kinetic effects of things, because you can add, add, put on any payload you want. I don't care if it's NVC, it doesn't matter. It's everything that's going on beforehand that has always been a, a big interest to me. So, the argument has been using the will. It's been about capabilities. And that's early on really what I was talking about. What are capabilities? And at that point in the early 90s, it was kind of us pretty much alone in the U.S. But there were a lot of capabilities being developed. And it became a psychological mindset. Are we willing, or are the bad guys willing to go asymmetric? And my argument was, and still is, yeah, they're going to go asymmetric because they don't give a shit. They don't care. Their belief systems, their cultures, whatever their religious beliefs, all these kind of things that we see are vastly different than us. So we are, cannot go by typical Klaus Wetzian type of symmetric warfare mindset. It's going to be asymmetric, and we've certainly seen this going on more and more over the years. And with what just happened with uh, that mall in Kenya, it's like, damn, I mean, it's really getting insane out there. So defensive postures were initially set up by U.S. military. And it was based upon uh, the Bella Podula model developed in the 1970s. And effectively it said, we're going to build big walls around our computers and keep the bad guys out. And that was the fourth network. We could dial in on our 300 baud, baud modems. And some of you may remember when we could download four pictures, it was a good night. There were small pictures on, well, then you got a 1,200 baud modem and I could get... 12 pictures down on the night, and it was my wife's always said, why are you on the internet so long? I said, well, they didn't call it the internet then. BBSs, right? Back then. So they developed the concept of fortress mentality. Keep the bad guys out. And the argument was, in the early days, at least when I was making, a few of us, a few of us were making, was how do you have anything working if you're not connecting? So the argument was, all right, you have a chocolate shop on Main Street. Do you want the bad guys in your store? Do you? Do you? He's, you don't want the bad guys in your store, do you? Right? What if they're chocolate-loving bad guys? Your goal is to sell chocolate, so you want the bad guys in if they buy chocolate. And how do you determine whether they're a good guy or a bad guy? <laughs> Before they rob you, or if you haven't said anything about getting paid yet either, have you? Buy. Well, go buy and paid. Okay, we're not going to do the semantics now. I'll take you to buy me a drink later. But the fortress mentality is not going to work, especially with what we're all trying to achieve today. And this was the mindset, and it still largely is. And if you talk to some of your DOD friends, the problems that they had 25 years ago are exactly the same today. Things are not getting any better at all. So, started looking at history, and I've always been a history buff, about when things got asymmetric. And we, I guess, mustered World War I, the A-bomb, in World War II, when we actually got asymmetric for alleged good reasons, whether you believe it or not, it was certainly an asymmetric move at the time. So, as we moved to the unipolar world, we thought it was going to be this peace dividend. So we scale down everything and say, oh, it's peace on Earth now. We won, which was clearly a massive, massive error because the whole concept of waging war on the Internet was anathema to most people. They couldn't grasp the concept of warfare being in this domain. And again, we were right, they were wrong, but unfortunately we're all suffering. And it becomes an issue of capabilities, in my mind, 
I don't care about motivations because I can assume very easily that the spectrum of motivations for the Mother Teresa to the truly, totally, completely evil Darth, whoever you want on this end of the spectrum, then everything else is going to be in the middle. It's about the capabilities in an open source world. And that's where we are and why we're sort of in the mess we're in today. So I got interested very early in the concept of weaponization. And we look at the history of technology, and we can go back how many thousands of years. Bronze was a great technology that was meant for good, and we adapted it for bad. We have continuously adapted all technologies and weaponized them one way or another. That's a song title somewhere, isn't it? So we keep weaponizing, and people keep introducing technologies in the hope that they're not going to get weaponized. So all of these things, you guys are all familiar with this kind of cool technology that came along, and how it has continuously been adapted for bad stuff. So new technologies. Was cryptography ever able to be used as a bad guy mechanism? Originally, no, it was the U.S. hegemony on it. And it was the only other technology other than nuclear weapons that was completely classified by the BOD and the uh, military establishment back in the 50s on because we owned that domain. And then Phil Zimmerman and Open Source and DES in 76, 77 came out, and it opened up this whole world of potential anonymity, disguising of data where the private citizen could actually participate in the same things that prior to that, only a generation earlier, were completely owned and operated by government. So that was a very, very fundamental change in the relationship between government, military, and private sector around the world. So we kept developing more and more technology. GPS was originally developed as a military technology. And how many of us don't have GPS on us right now? Probably not one person in this room. Can the bad guys use it? Yes. Do they use it? Yes. We have a defense against it. This bigger defense, and the only thing we can do currently, is change the accuracy of the GPS signal. And we can change it from 10 feet to 100 feet to 1,000 feet, which then means aircrafts then have a whole different system of takeoff and landing and flying than they currently do because they're relying upon the same sort of stuff. Uh, satellite reconnaissance. I don't see too many people here with the aluminum hats on. But we all know that the NSA is listening in on our thoughts in because they have this technology that they got from the aliens and it's out at S4 Area 51. There was an aluminum hat talk. Oh, cool. I should have been there for that. So what we have to look at is life cycle. And one of the things that, again, there's no magic here. This is just a standard old life cycle curve is the concept of when an idea for a technology is developed, typically it's done from a benign profit-making or hopefully humanitarian aspect. And then there's the proof of concept, and we finally end up with deployment. The issue has become, in my mind, at what point through life cycle, from concept on, does weaponization occur? At what point do we start looking at the hostile aspects of technology? Yes, sir. I'm not going to argue with you on it. I'm. I, that's a question. I don't have to have answers. I'm the speaker. Yes, sir. So you're saying during growth. So the bad guys aren't going to be at any research conference anywhere where concept is originally done. What? Concept. Anywhere and everywhere is another perfectly good. See, the bad guys are going to wait until it's mature. I think everybody's voting you out of the island. <laughs> Again, I, I don't have to have answers. I just have to pose the questions here and hopefully get the community. That's what this is really about, where we're going to be headed in a few minutes is getting the community to hopefully buy into some of these concepts that I'm going to put forth. And my belief is that the speaker won't feed back, that when we come up with a great idea, the bad guys are watching. Why would they not 
be watching. You got to turn the question upside down. Just because it doesn't it's avoid and successful, does that mean that you, if you had a bad guy hat on, you would not be aware of what's going on? We all read science geek engineering crap all the time. Are all geeks good guys? They hire a lot of us because they we can't get hired often into the good guy places. So understanding life cycles is, in my mind, very, very important to understanding how technology is going to be progressing. So, argument, all technologies will be weaponized. Period. Yet, I remember sitting with Al Gore in 1990 in Nashville, and he announces, oh, we have now the information superhighway. And the cameras were rolling from NBC, and I thankfully had a front row seat. And I said, Mr. Al, Mr. Al, this is all really cool with the internet and all this, you want all these awesome, right? I said, but what about, and I laid out a few ideas on how the internet would be weaponized. Gore leans over to somebody and says, who the hell is this guy? Get him out of here. And that bit actually made it on NBC. It was kind of cool. But he, they were trying to only put the positive spin on stuff. Anybody been to an Apple store and hear how secure MDM is? Seriously, Apple, uh, it's, it's just, this positive spin on everything is hurting us, and we as a community have to readapt some of the thinking and look at the hostile way things are going to be occurring. IPv6, oh, we're going to migrate. What are we at, 4% migration? Is that the number currently, something like that? Um, somebody gave me that number, and I don't know, but I, nobody's really arguing. I'll stick with it for a bit. But was IPv6 really designed for functionality or security? It was designed largely for functionality, address space issues, and there's an awful lot of null packets in there. And I've spoken to a bunch of IPv6 guys that are infinitely smarter than me. And they're saying, oh, we know how to weaponize this. And so there's some cool stuff coming out on the weaponization of IPv6. It's like, damn. I had, and there were some alternatives in the design of the protocol that were available at the time using various types of nulls or defaults that they could be modified later on for real application and utility. But, again, we did not think of this because IPv6 was going to solve all of our IPv4 problems. And, again, I don't believe that for a minute. You ever talk, when, when you're online talking to your foreign people, it's Is that a real woman that's talking to you, sir? Probably not. So you're getting off talking to a computer? Is that what you're telling us? What's your name? Pearson? Where do you work? Nowhere. Not anymore. So we've got all these chatbots and now with Siri and whatever the droid voice is called. You, who are you talking to? Is it a computer? Is it not a computer? And you know that old phrase, on the internet, you never know who's a dog or something like that. Now that we're using this technology so much, how do you weaponize it? How do you weaponize it? I'm not looking for answers this minute. I want your mind. You guys are the brilliant people in the community to figure this shit out before we get nailed by it. Yes, sir. That's one way. There's probably 20 ways or 30 ways once the beer starts flowing later. Weapon, seriously, that's where cool shit comes up at cons. That's, we're not here to listen to me. We're here for beer at 5 o'clock. Let's get real. But we're going to weaponize this stuff one way or another. I'd rather the community figure it out ahead of time because only then can we start defending against the future instead of waiting for the bad guys to already implement it. Some other technologies are coming out. How do we weaponize telephones? We've already done it. Back in those days, I mean, I grew up on those dial things. I got busted by the FBI for hacking those three slot machines when I was like 10 or 12 years old. They slapped me around a little bit. And then we've got mobile. What is this, sir? Fucking A. He got the right answer off the gate. It's a computer. And how do we treat these things? 
like their old Nokia's. Is Nokia still in business, or do they drink all the Kool-Aid? They drank all the damn Kool-Aid. Got it. These are computers, and MDM solves all of our problems because Apple told us so. And again, the Kool-Aid is being drunk, another version of it. And was security ever considered in any of these devices? Of course not, because it was only a consumer device. Consumerization is one of the worst things that's ever happened to networks. And how many CEOs or board level, C level folks have said, no, consumer devices? Anybody in this room have your board level people just say no? He said it from the iPhone. Yeah, the mantra, I want my iPad, yeah, comes from the board, from the C level suites. So, weaponization of these. Is it going to happen? It already is happening. Three billion of these sons of bitches out there, and the bad guys are going to completely ignore it, aren't they? They're never going to go after casual users. Good luck on the camera, dude. Just not going to happen. <laughs> Just. So, uh, I, if anybody's interested, I do have some papers out called Cyber War 4G, which covers an awful lot of the issues that are going on with mobile and where we're going to end up in the coming years. Oh, here's the slide. Perfect. This gets into more and more. We're going to have 20 billion of these things out by the end of the decade. Some sort of mobile IP-enabled stuff. Fundamental problem, real quickly, these are single-user, non-multitasking devices. Steve Jobs, rest in peace, you're still wrong because there's only a half a dozen, I think it's seven, built-in native multitasking capabilities, and anything you can make it multitask beyond that is called what? Jailbreaking, Betsy, you're right. Low five on that one, you weren't fast. So the numbers are already speaking for it. I remember three years ago, I got into an, uh, a debate with some, one of the guys, uh, one of the analysts from Gartner or Aberdeen, one of them, and he made the statement, the bad guys will never build malware for mobile. And my first comment, and I actually put this to the article, the editor, I said, are you fucking kidding me? Does he still work for you? <laughs> I mean, if they have analysts with that kind of opinion, well, you guys get it. So, next thing that I'm really interested in is EMP and Hertz. Why do I care about EMP and Hertz? Why? Renders technology useless, perfectly good word. And we've known about it since the, some of the early tests in Bikini Island in 1946. And it was one of the accidental side effects when suddenly the ship's na navigation and comm systems that were monitoring the test went down. They go, I wonder why. Well, they had to call Oppenheimer. He goes, oh, yeah, that's a side effect we forgot to tell you about. <laughs> Fair enough. But we have her high-energy radio frequency, EMP, electromagnetic pulse, HPM, high power microwave signals, and we're starting to see programs that have been highly classified in the, in the military began in the late 70s called DO, Directed Energy Weapon, sort of Star Trek-y, Star War-ish -war kind of stuff, and I was curious, what can the bad guys do? So the first one I saw, I don't have the picture up here, was in Holland. 1990, and it was part of the old Star Wars project, and they had, anybody know what a Jacob Ladder is? Any EE -E kind of people in the room? All right, cool. I keep forgetting we got good geeks here. It's not RSA corporate asshole. I just, you know. <laughs> and so Jacob's Ladder is, you know, it's an electrical multiplier, and these guys were just fucking around with it in order to make Christmas-like do some cool stuff in their condo. Turns out their neighbors said, how come you're turning off our computers? Oh, unintended effects. Cool. And they ended up being able to, we did some testing, and be able to essentially spark gap discharge and take down stuff for a couple hundred feet. And it was random. You couldn't repeat it, but I really got intrigued by this. So at InfoWarCon in 94, 95, I got a buddy of mine who built this device down here in the lower left, and 
or in a microwave antenna, so it was fairly wide dispersion pattern, was able to shoot down shit for a couple, he said a kilometer, he lived out in the desert, and he did some testing, I, and I saw it inside of buildings, so it was much uh, shorter range, but he was doing the desert stuff. And I said, well, how can we do something even cheaper? So, some of you know who Heinrich Hertz is. Who does not know Heinrich Hertz? Embarrass yourself with your hands. No hands go up. Oh, wait, you don't know who Heinrich Hertz is? 60 Hertz on the wall, right? Hertz. He was the guy. He invented electricity. <laughs> if you believe this, get the hell. No, I'm kidding. Um, and so we found his original book on a Hertzian generator. And it was in his book of his, I think it was from 1882. And we said, let's build one. It was a car battery and some copper. Plugged it in, shot it off, had a capacitor on it so we could do some spark gap stuff. And thankfully the guy with the pacemaker didn't die. The VCR died, the cameras died, and we started to, wow, this is really cool. And then we upped it with a couple more car batteries and finally shot off a terawatt next to a national airport. And well, no, don't be scared of a terawatt. And the whole point is, yes, just, if, if anybody read my book, Time-Based Security, a few of you maybe, uh, it's, it's called Divide by Time. A terawatt over how much time, because then you're looking at average power, like RMS power versus peak spontaneous power. People forget that these are all part of the fundamental Hertzian equations. Again, I'm going back 150 years here on fundamental EE stuff that we've ignored. Now. You work for a bank. Which bank do you work for when you're not diddling? No banks. All right, I can see why. Imagine branch office going down at 946 for no known reason. Reboot transmission. 1013 goes down for no reason. 1117 goes down for no reason disruption services that cannot be tracked, cannot be seen unless you've got specific EMP type of monitoring capability, which puts you then into the nation state realm. Are the bad guys going to use this? Take a look at the British tabloids and papers of 1996, headline, British gangs taking down banking services to the tune of 400 million pounds. One article published and the Secret Service and MI6 pulled them everything immediately thereafter. The technology has been used at a fairly high level. Is it going to be adapted? My belief is yes. Which comes up to the concept, how do you defend against it? Shielding, now that's cost effective. How do you defend against something like this? Optronics. That's going to, we're going to convert the whole world from silicon to optronics in by the time ITV6 gets installed, right? <laughs> How do you defend against this? Research, start somewhere. My answer is, number one, you guys start thinking about it. Number two, graceful degradation. How do you take your networks, when they're under attack of any sort of attack from any vector, how do you gracefully degrade services without having a binary function? Digital is not binary. It's still on a spectrum. Our network, we design this flat, all or nothing mindset. All data is equal. Let's protect absolutely everything all the same. It's not real. So some of the fundamental concepts that we're using in the C-suite guys have this binary mindset. It's either on or it's off. Degrade services gracefully under your control and design those into your networks. Yes, sir. I've seen your hand up for 30 minutes. It's time. It was a spike of a couple nanoseconds. Yeah, you can. I'll, I'll do the math with you after this. I'll show you the math after this. Because it wasn't me. It, uh, you're applying capacitors and Jacob's Ladder concepts in order to drive it. And I'll, I have all the papers. I'll send you everything. So I'm not the mathematician behind it, but I'm, I'll be happy to send you everything. And it's all been heavily published. Some more technologies. UAVs. I'm, a few years ago, did some work on we had a UAV helicopter, everybody goes, ooh, that's really cool. Well, now, 
What's happening with UAVs? Has anybody seen the pizza delivery helicopter? That's kind of cool. As these get more and more prolific outside of the military domain, and we start to commercialize them, and the FAA now is actually paying more attention to this. Put on your evil hat. What can you do? Pizzas falling from the sky. Or can we intentionally cause some sort of damage to our unmanned vehicles? Uh, right now we're talking about uh, the cars that are all going to be autonomous driving because they're going to be safer. Mm. Are we going to screw with them? Has anybody screwed up with car hacking yet in the room? All right. We need more of this because I was on the phone with uh, OnStar three years ago. Three years ago. Okay? And they said, we want to add some security. I said, what do you need? Oh, we want this to work and this work. It actually has some decent ideas. I said, yeah, but you need this, you need some tunneling and all this to keep out comm interference, et cetera, et cetera. They said, yeah, but that's going to up the cost like $4. For your $37,000 car, that $4 is going to break your bank. And what are we seeing now? We're seeing, what do they call it, the CAN, Car Area Network, I think was the term Ed used yesterday. It was awesome. And there's a University of Ohio. Right now, is doing a hacking on 100. And they've got 150 people now, actually hacking all of these cars. I want you guys to think about the evil side of this before the evil guys start taking over and we start losing more and more. There we go. Um, in Germany, does anybody know what biscuit tin security is? No, all right. In Germany, they're really paranoid about these things. So what they do is they've got a Faraday cage, a biscuit tin, on conference tables. They drop everything and they seal it. Now, I've got a smiley button with a full HD camera. I don't know what they're going to do with that, but... Now that we understand how bumblebees fly and we can duplicate it in silicon and graphene and all of that, when you're in a meeting, super, super sensitive board meeting, and there's a fly in the room, what do you do? Cancel the meeting. Yeah, okay. We are going to have a very difficult time being able to distinguish quickly what is carbon units and what are silicon units? How do we adapt ourselves to this kind of, whether it's espionage, uh, whatever term you want to use for this technology, are we ready to start defending against it or are we going to have to wait for the first half a dozen massive incidents and then start having to play catch up again? And I'm really tired after 30 years of security of still playing catch up. I want to get thinking about these things earlier and earlier. Some of the stuff that's being done is just amazing these days. Uh, some of the new technologies that have come out. The problem is we're going to have various levels of bioengineered prosthetics. Can we fuck with that technology? How are we going to screw with it? You it's going to have an internal comm system. It's going to have an operating system. It is going to be uh, affected by EMI. We're going to have all of the same problems we have with these devices, desktop, whatever. Now we're going to merge it with the human. Are we ready for that when the bad guys start screwing with it? Or should we start designing in higher levels of defensive posture before massive deployment of these technologies? I argue we need to do better defensive engineering at the life cycle development curve, and part of every development team should have hostile people as part of it. Build in the hostile mindset the very, very beginning of every one of your development cycles. Brain stuff. Uh, did anybody see the TV show? Uh, it was one of the news channels. I forget which one. It was not Fox. So it was okay. 
when they had uh, a quadriplegic lady and they gave her some implants on her brain and full mobility with silicon devices and hardware. It was absolutely amazing. She was able to actually eat ice cream using her brain waves to instruct these add-on prosthetics. It was like absolutely amazing. Are we going to be able to screw with this? Answer is yes. So this technology is in alpha stage. It's proof of concept. It works. I want evil minds addressing it now before some committee sets some IEEE standards and says this is all going to work great in an ideal, non-hostile environment. And that's unfortunately how so many RFCs are done and how many standards are created. They assume a benign environment, and I don't believe that we live in a benign environment. Uh, we're going to be treating mental illness with more and more electronic type of impulse. Uh, we're seeing much more with um, audio waves and cancellation frequencies and making some, uh, it's called a stamp, is the word. Uh, it's an interference patterns that exist electromagnetically that are having very, very profound effects upon various levels of mental illness. How do we screw with that? The military is taking sound waves and using them for crowd control. Is that going to ever end up in the hands of the bad guys? Hell yeah, because whatever the good guys can build for a million dollars, you, when you're not looking at porn, can do it for ten dollars. That's what this community does. Takes that million dollar thing and say, I can do it for five dollars. So NASA takes the thousand dollar 3D printer and says, I can build that for two hundred eighty thousand dollars. It the other way around. Point is, this community knows how to reverse engineer shit and duplicate stuff on the cheap. I want it done more and more for these new technologies. Distributed technology, distributed power, uh, the largest computer in the world. What is it? Who knows? Porn dude. You want to stand up so everybody can see you and make fun of you later? <laughs> What's the largest computer in the world? Red 2. No. In silicon, not carbon units. Thank you. Largest computer. No, NSA. No. What? China. China. <laughs> Largest computer in the world are hostile botnets. Think about it. It's what we use with SETI. And as anybody, I guess some of you probably were part of the SETI. We were using unused cycles in order to go search. That's what botnets effectively are. And they fluctuate. They've got some really good CNCs on the background running all these things. Is this capability that was unique to us and, you know, Hitachi in China and a half a dozen people that can afford to build billion dollar computers, now it's available to the bad guys for how much money? Damn close to free, isn't it? They steal it and they rely upon ignorance and apathy on the part of users in order to become part of them. So the same technology that was relegated only to nation states 20 years ago, 30 years ago, is now currently part of the bad guy's arsenal. How do we defend against this? We can't, because I can't get anybody in Washington to even acknowledge it's a problem. Because they don't understand the fundamental nature of multi-threading, multitasking, and all this MPU kind of things that are going on. And the guys at uh, Lawrence Livermore and uh, near where I live in, uh, yeah, outside of Knoxville, they get it, but getting anything up in the DOE hierarchy is not happening. Yes, sir. That's ten dollars for that ad, sir. All right, thank you. Oh, how about uh, we talked about all that? That's uh, EC2. Uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan of EC2. I think Amazon has actually done an amazing job. Cloud stuff, notwithstanding, I love the total flexibility of the way the network works. Will Amazon sell massive amounts of EC2 space to Al Qaeda? He says yes. Will they? Of course they will, because Al Qaeda is going to use anonymity. They're going to use good guy stuff, and nobody's going to know because they're not going to look inside of it. The same technology that's available to us, again, is so available to the bad guys, and we're not considering this in the way that they're attacking. Four years ago, I was looking for a present for my seven or eight year old 
nephew. I was white or rust or something. And they had this intelligent nanotech thing, but it was on a macro scale. It's kind of like big Legos. And they had von Neumann Automata architecture built into it. It was absolutely awesome. It's unpredictable behavior. It was tremendous. So as we move forward in this world of nanotech, the bad guys, are they going to have access to nano? Toys R Us. You know, you know, bad guys only go to Toys R Us. You know, you're back with this guy if you believe this hurts or whatever. This technology is going to be awesome. We can do some tremendously great, great things with it. Turn on your evil hat, please. Please turn on your evil hat. Let's figure out what is so great in this technology that we might be able to have some defensive postures built into it. Or is the cat so far out of the bag on this one that we're completely screwed? I don't know the answer. But I do know it's going to be weaponized. One way or another, it's going to be weaponized, and we need to start thinking of what the defenses are going to be, and the only way to do that is to figure out how to turn them into weapons first. And it has to be done in an open source environment, not classified behind DOD or MI6 or a GCHQ. It's got to be done open source, so we can have real discussions, and maybe there's a way to build some defenses in. I don't know the answer, but I do know the question, and I know the frustration I've had for 30 years getting to the point we are. Swarming and self-organization. Everybody familiar with John Neumann Automata theory? Or, all right, quick brief on this. Simple rule set. If I am here, in one second, move here. Next second, move here. Now you take, that's the entire rule set. Now you take 20,000 things, throw them all together with the same rule set, what happens? Is it predictable? No. Unpredictable chaos theory. And that's what Automatsoft theory and, and uh, what Neumann was working on and Shannon was working on back in the 1930s and 1940s. So now, anybody read the Michael Crichton book, Swarm? All right, if you haven't read it, read it, because it takes this concept very, very well. And it's a little science fiction-ish, but you know, again, we're looking into the future. What happens when we introduce chaos into systems? Can we actually do it? And using exceedingly simple rule sets, which means one or two lines of code, I can introduce chaos. This is emergent theories. What happens if I introduce that into, instead of trying to steal your data at uh, the New York Stock Exchange, the spam message is hostile, but it has an automatic chaos trigger? What happens? I don't know the answer because it's unpredictable. I know it's not good. How many people are really studying this? Unfortunately, not enough. Because it is in the realm of mathematics, it's in the realm of unpredictability, chaos theory, synchronicity, they all get into this mysterious area that we do not understand. But we need to start really understanding that there is going to be a problem as we approach the singularity more and more. As the technology gets more and more powerful, introducing chaos is going to be done by accident. How do we know this? Windows 2000 never crashed. Show of hands. That is the epitome. Oh no, this is probably the epitome of it. But the Windows 2000 was a monumental achievement with 64 million lines of code. And we, the world, were the beta testers. You know, I remember Microsoft said we tested it for 10,000 hours. And I said, wait a minute, let me do some math. 50 million users, one week, and it was like, what, 2 billion hours suddenly, and we're the beta testers. Same concept here. Can we pre-beta test with modeling ahead of time? Does anybody remember when we actually had real, honest-to-God computer security? Anybody old enough to really remember? You, what was it called? And the only security system in the world that was ever rated called A1, which was on the old orange book spectrum back in the early 80s, it was called Skunk. And it was secure operating mainframe protocol, I don't know, something like that. And the way that security used to be done before it got fizzled down in the world that we're in, and the rise of self-organization and chaos 
in complex systems was mathematical formalization. And there were these massive formulas you could work out proofs, mathematical proofs, that all of this stuff was actually going to be secure and actually going to work. We don't do that anymore because things had gotten so complex. As complexity increases, security goes down, and chaos is automatically triggered into the system. We've got to really start investigating this stuff a lot more than just lock picking, in my, in, in my humble opinion. All right, uh, biochem, same concept. Uh, my first experiment with my chemistry set when I was five, what was the first thing I built? Sir, what was the first thing I built? What? Nope, not blue. Nope. Hydrogen sulfide, people. Hello. It was a stink bomb, of course, because I was, oh, there's hydrogen, there's sulfide. <laughs> done. And, you know, my mom was really mad at me. And we've all done that. Now, look what we're able to do today. Meth labs have gotten really, really sophisticated. We have distributed technology. I'm no expert at this stuff at all. But I do know that we need to be addressing defensive postures against some of the capabilities that are built in in the open source arena. Uh, same thing with uh, DNA. Uh, Chupacabra down in Puerto Rico was obviously made by the NSA, right, as an experiment with alien breeding. When this technology hits open source and becomes a $50 item, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? I don't know the answer, but I hopefully will be. I don't want to die by then. But it's going to be something that we're probably not going to be pleasant because we're seeing more and more of this kind of magic occurring. Uh, batteries. Finally, finally, batteries are really, really getting cool. We're going to have distributed, non-grid, off-the-grid style power. That's awesome for us. What about the bad guys? When the bad guys get off the grid, what's that going to make our job? One hell of a lot harder to find them because they're going to have access to the same off-the-grid technologies that we do. Makes building stuff in caves a hell of a lot easier than worrying about a power line coming down to it or having to supply it with gas and petrol all the time fundamental change in how we're going to have to look at defensive postures by using technology that the bad guys are going to have access to as well. Uh, all sorts of possible answers, and I'm happy to make the slides available to anybody, and I know my time is almost out here. Um, I know a friend of mine, he says he wants to pass a whole mess of laws. Yeah, right on. That's going to work. Uh, don't forget, we in the U.S. are only 4% of the population. Our laws are like a town sheriff in the south who wants to harass the beaters from the north. We are a local ordinance when it comes to legalities globally. It's never going to work at all. International stuff. Uh, classify it. Yeah, that's always worked in the past too, right? Uh, Sometimes maybe some of you guys have actually had technologies picked up by DOD or those guys. I just don't think, I think we need to absolutely be completely open source with this entire arena. Do we turn ourselves into a police state? Well, again, we're only 4% of the planet. Are the bad guys going to have access to this stuff? That's the fundamental issue that we have totally ignored until China really came along. And then coming down scared shitless, Carrington Effect. If you don't know the Carrington Effect, please Google it. What happens if a CME, corona mass ejection, actually hits the Earth as predicted by NASA and all that, if the angle of the dangle and all of that is absolutely correct, Low probability, high impact. The entire planet shuts down for 18 months. 18 months, the planet is off. How do we defend against it? Yes, you can. The defense against it is to have a graceful degradation model because we have seven hours of warning. If the CME and the angle of the dangle is correct, turn the planet off. Unload every transformer in the world. Is the only protection against this. Can it be done? Yes. Will it be done? No, because we're going to get politicians involved to help us. So, my answer is develop offense and defense at the same time. Get rid of the existing internet, IPv4, V6. Build something else. Bill Cheswick and I are doing a talk at RSK on that. Learn how to turn shit off and still have capability. 
some level of capability after you turn your shit off. And keep in mind, we're the ones who fucked this up. We gave the users a hell of a lot more. Would we ever give a user a 777 cockpit to drive down a highway? No, we give them a Volkswagen, right? And we are giving them complex stuff to screw up. We keep blaming the users. It's our fault for giving it to them. And it's our fault for never looking at the bad side of technology before we deployed it. Otherwise, DOS would never have taken off. Thank you very much. I'll be around for you later. Thank you. Um, out of the, I don't have one here. It's all out there at the table.